Okay, so welcome to this session about uh, delayed operations with Q. Some of you uh, might wonder what, why we are trying to delay something when a Drupal 8 has already been delayed so much, but it's not exactly the same kind of delay. Let's see what it's about. First off, who are we? Yuri? Hello, my name is Yuri. Um, I, my main role, I'm working for the company FFW. I was from part of Pro People, and uh, I was mainly the developer. Then I worked as a team leader, and I'm working as an architect. So I'm involved a lot in architecturing the projects that we implement, and this is where my experience with queues came up. Um, also, I was involved in contributing to Drupal a little bit. So I worked on services, module, draggable views, and some others. Uh, also, I'm working on some little tool about visual regression. That's Backtrack Dio. But today we are going to talk about my Drupal background and what we have done with queues. And I'm Frédéric Maron, alias FGM, or sometimes Ozinet on Drupal.org. I'm mostly doing performance consulting work on media sites and mostly in France. I've been a long time contributor to Drupal Core since Drupal 4.7, I guess. And I also maintain the MongoDB module suite and the XML RPC subsystem in Drupal 7 and now in Contrib as of Drupal 8. One thing which may be interesting is that we now have already worked with on four different customer projects for Drupal 8, even before the Drupal 8 release. We even have some of these in production these days, and I'm known by some to have added queuing systems to several projects. So, of course, the first question is, why do we want to use queues? Yeah, so, when we, when we are talking about queues, we have multiple areas where they can be applied. So the first one is the speed for the visitors. So when our visitors are looking at the website and they're performing some actions that will take some time, sometimes it's reasonable to actually put them into the queue, I mean these jobs, and then still display something to the users, like your request has been pro is in progress or something like that, and then after the job is processed to display them results. So they are not just holding on the line and waiting that something happen or, or not happen. So this is very important for the user experience. Uh, the next one is very similar thing, but for the editors. And the use case can be a little bit different. So when we create a content and there are some third party integrations, we need to push that content some, somewhere else. So we need to perform very heavy computational actions. This is something that people also should not just sitting and waiting till they will finish. They should have some message, ideally with a progress bar, but it will depend. So it's very important for editors also to have very fast response, what is happening with their content and what's happening with their work that they just completed. And another thing that is very important is scalability. So when we have a lot of visitors to the website and they start hitting our services very hard and uh, we can have multiple bottlenecks and some of bottlenecks for example database writes this is another thing that can happen and it will slow all your operations down very fast just because of the spike of the traffic so if you would put the op these kind of operations in the queue you can also survive and scale pretty a lot this is at one end of the spectrum. This is the, the part of Drupal itself, which is slow. At the other end of the spectrum, we can also have jobs which are actually intrinsically slow because of the data they are handling. For instance, if you consider video encoding, you obviously don't want to do a, a video encoding while someone is waiting for the page to display. Or even if you consider the case of a photo journalist going to a fashion show and bringing back tons and tons of photographs that need to be uploaded, you don't want to have him post his form, wait for the 16 megabyte photo to be uploaded, then click on the next and so on. You want to have operations which are performed in the background from the UI user standpoint and which don't interfere with the normal operation of the site. This is a, a set of types of problems uh, which can be handled by adding a queuing system on top of Drupal. More precisely, some concrete use cases. 
Yeah, so for the use case, we have, from our experience, we have identified several ones. So the first one is when we create the content for non-Drupal frontends. And uh, we will be talking about each of them in detail. So uh, the second one is anticipated content generation. This is something to deal with refreshing caches when, they, when we know that they are, going, they are about to expire. We can do something. Um, then we can have deferred submits. This is something that is about scalability. So the use case is we have plenty of users who are just bombing us with comments, but they don't need to see their comments like immediately. Uh, we will talk about that. Uh, also slow operations like video processing, that, that is another area. Um, external data fetching. So this is when we are working in the area with, when we need to pull or push the content from other resources, and this can take some time. And uh, also, the last one that you are probably using all the time, it's batch operations in Drupal. So they do use queues. It's, and of course, it's batch, not patch. It's just a typo, of course. <laughs> so the first use case is about front ends, you read? Yes. So the architecture for the Drupal in this area is that we can have very nice Drupal that is very familiar for editors, very convenient. It has beautiful structure for the editors only. So this is kind of like back office of our application. And the front end, we have so many new technologies that are way more faster, uh, way more interactive. They can build, they can be built in other languages, like in JavaScript and whatever. And they could use not MySQL database for fetching the data for their pages. So one of the examples, it can be, for example, Silex application, and it can use Redis for pulling the data. Redis is like blazingly fast. But for Drupal to assemble all the data, if we are going to have uh, multiple pages where the content is being displayed, and like we prepare the data for each page and refresh it and put it to the Redis that is going to be used by our front end, this operation can take some time. And um, this is very... Uh, important thing, for example, in media websites, when you can have one article, but it should appear in multiple front pages, and each front page is like five pages, and it's huge, and we need to regenerate it. So this operation can be a little bit time-consuming. So in this case, we still, uh, for example, we have these pages before the editing of the content, and then editor changed something, and then we create a job in the queue that actually tells the workers, these are little drush icons, that uh, we need to regenerate this set of pages. And then when the queue is handled by one of the workers, it goes to all the pages, generate the content, and put it to the Redis. And then front end will get just updated pages in this way. The beauty of, of, of it, of course, is that at no point does the user experience any lag. Until the worker is done uh, cooking the page for the front, the front end still serves the previous version of the, uh, the page, and only when the new version is ready in Redis does it switch to the new version. There's never any user getting a page miss. We can go further than that by anticipating generation. This is a, something which is not so well known, but let's consider how it works. On the top line, you have the typical Drupal workflow for a page. At some point, content is generated. At that point, the content is considered to be fresh. It's news, it's fresh, and it can be put in cache. And indeed, most sites you have been working on will probably have a caching system in place so that for the duration of the cache available for that data, the data will be served from the cache. Everything will be fast, and it will be good. However, after some time has elapsed, the data is still valid in the cache. It's not expired, but it's not really so fresh. If you are dealing with uh, high-frequency information like um, 
uh, fresh news or you know, agency news or maybe uh, stock quotations. You need to have very uh, fast, refreshing information. And after a few seconds or a few minutes in the cache, information is still relevant. You don't want to replace it necessarily before displaying the page. But it needs to be updated because it's stale. It's no longer fresh. So uh, what will you do in, uh, with Drupal normally? Since it's not expired, you're still serving the page from cache. It's still fast, but it's no longer so relevant for the user. Imagine considering uh, looking at uh, sports uh, re retransmission and getting a report of the, the goals scored only two minutes later <laughs> after the goal has been scored. And then when the cache finally expires, one unlucky user will get a cache miss, the, the page will be rebuilt from the, the, the source data, and will be fresh again. But one user, at least, will, uh, will have taken a miss, meaning possibly several seconds to rebuild uh, the, the page, which is not a good experience. What we can do is anticipate this generation. So the content starts by being created, and when it's, it's, it's when it is still fresh, it's served from cache, no change. However, at some point, we introduce uh, a lap time in which the content is marked as stale. It's still served from cache, just as previously. But in, at the same time that you send the request to the, to the user browser, you also push a refresh request to a queue, saying, please uh, update this data. Some worker in the background will take the, the information about what needs to be refreshed, will fetch the information, rebuild the, the relevant you know, information from data sources, from the database, from whatever, rebuild possibly pages like Yuri showed on the previous slide, and store the content in an updated cache. At this point, before the, the cache itself has really expired, you uh, again have fresh information stored in cache, and it has replaced the previous fresh information. So whatever the time, you're always serving fresh information from the cache. You're, no user is getting a cache miss. So all, everything happens in a hidden time. This is uh, something we have been put to use in many news sites in France. So another Another use case is deferred submits. And this is where we have a lot of uh, traffic. We have a traffic spike, and it's not a hard thing to do. You can post something on Reddit or on some social campaign, and this is what a lot of media companies do. And when they have it, they expect a lot of people to comment on the article. And the problem is that if you will have a lot of people doing this commenting and you will just insert the records in the database, the database can go down because you will have locks on the table and like a lot of these performance issues. So the idea is that instead of putting the comments right to the database as they come, we put them into the queue. And then we have a worker that actually get the records for the comments and uh, it pulled it in the, in the database, but also it does this thing in batches. So instead of doing multiple inserts, it goes for one insert with multiple records. In this way, we also optimize the process of inserting the data to the database. Um, in this particular example, that's one of our implementations. And I would like to go through it because it has also some security um, enhancements. So in this project, we were dealing with two groups of web servers. So the public facing web servers, they had only, they had read only access to the database. So all the operations that were requiring actually writes to the database from the users, like commenting or registering, that was happening through the queues. In this way, uh, we knew exactly what information is coming and whatever amount of information we'll get in, it will not put our servers down. It will just make some interaction slower, but anyway, it will work. And um, on technical level, for example, when we were submitting comments, we were actually doing JavaScript cross the main post requests to some very lightweight a PHP application that was storing all the data to the queue. And we implemented the custom queuing mechanism, like in Redis. And then there was another worker that was another 
little custom PHP application that was grabbing all the data from queues and putting that data to the database. On a technical level, this daemon that, I mean, this worker that was on the other PHP application that was running with PHP daemon. Oops. Yeah. And uh, we had in this way the access to the database. The other group of web servers that were also Drupal servers, they were for editors. So they were not involved, they were not publicly available. You needed to do the VPN connection to access them. But the great thing about this idea is that when we had this Drupal get done thing, when, when we had this huge security issue with, uh, with database access, like this project didn't affect like at all because we had read-only uh, web heads that were publicly available. So this is about both deferred submits but also some security implementations. Let's go for the next one. The next case, and which is maybe the most uh, common and the best known, is uh, the issue of uh, getting data into your Drupal sites. For this, you have really two ways of getting at data, which is pulling the data from external sources or receiving data which are pushed into your site. If we consider the case of pulling data, uh, you probably are familiar with this, at least with the aggregator. And if you've built any intranet or extranet application, you probably have seen situations where people have been putting blocks on the site in which they were doing HTTP requests synchronously with the page, which is awful because when the server blocks upstream your own site blocks, which this should never happen, it's a spoof, a single point of failure. But also, even when it works, it's still not, uh, not fast for the user because it, it will always incur at least the cost of uh, the, 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 the upstream uh, data call. So how do you use a queue for this? Typically, you have uh, an external process, ah, sorry, which is here, which can be triggered by cron or by any type of scheduler, and which will, uh, which will periodically request uh, jobs to uh, send, jo well, send, send job update re requests to the queue saying, please refresh this feed. So it pushes data here. And whenever a worker is available because it has finished processing uh, previous uh, data refreshes, the, the worker gets the de description from the, for the queue item, fetches uh, the, the associated information source, and pushes it to Drupal over the, the Drupal API. This is also interesting because it means you can control how many work workers can perform in parallel. You, know, you are not linked with the, the fact that it has one runner on this schema. You can implement two or three or as many as you want, and you are controlling how many workers perform at any given time because the queue has, acts as a serializer. Only one job can go through a queue at any given time. You are in charge of the bandwidth, and it avoids choking your server under too much load. This is even more relevant for with push data sources. Push data sources are the ones where some provider, we have this with the sports news, for instance, will call your site, sending either the data themselves or, or a request to refresh from their site in pull mode after receiving the push. What you typically do in this case is that you implement a web service. It can be Drupal, but usually it will be something a bit faster, like a small Silex or a Symfony controller, just serving a web service able to receive this news and push the raw data into the queue. Again, this serves to serialize the requests. So even if you have multiple providers sending you a torrent of data, your workers will still control how much job work is being done at any given time. It's very hard to saturate a small worker in a small web service done in Silex just pushing data to a, to a queue. You can do over 10,000 inserts per second on any of the queues we are, will be discussing a, a bit later. So it's very hard to saturate this. And uh, when the rate flows down, uh, goes down, your worker catch up with what has been accumulated in the queue and still is doing inserts one at a time in your Drupal database, meaning your site does not slow down, even if there's too much uh, information peak at any given time. I can talk about this. So, and one of the other um, applications of the queues is heavy 
heavy processes. And that means like it will go beyond like, your time limit of like 30 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever you think acceptable for your users to wait for the page. And we can take example of the resizing or processing the big images. We have the use case when uh, we had a client who was working with some like big images and they actually warned us like, oh, we are going to upload big images. And like, okay, big images like 10 megabytes, right? And then when 150 megabytes arrived, Oh, that was like huge issue for the server. So it just like went down, like never images were processed, like nothing worked. And also we had another thing because the images were so huge and they really wanted to give ability for visitors of the site actually to see very small details of the images. We had to go for this solution when you split the image into tiles and then display the image as the map. So in this way, actually processing of the each image to split it into tiles, it will take some time. So in this scenario, we were, um, the idea of implementation is actually user uploads the huge image to the Drupal, and Drupal sends the job to the queue that, oh, we have received a new image, we need to process it. And then when we had a job uh, worker, it processed the image, it stored everything to the file system, and then it's just let know Drupal by writing to the database, okay, this image is processed, now you can display your map. And this is kind of general scheme of the job servers. When we have heavy computational or some other jobs that will take some time, like instead of doing them online during the page request, like queue them up, and then you will have multiple workers. So in this way, you actually parallel your workers, they can be on the other servers, like you can go crazy with this. And then results can be stored. Let's go for the next one. And um, when we are dealing with job servers, when you're planning for some operations, you need to be aware of multiple things. So the first very important thing is like how to get results. Because in some cases, it's fine, okay, if every worker, it will process some job and it will put the results to the database. In some cases, that is fine. In some cases, it's not really fine because you don't want to have workers to deal with your database. It's just about like security implications. You don't want to have anyone but not local host to deal with your access to the database. So you need to deal with that. In some, in, in one implementation, we have just created another queue for the results. So we actually had like one uh, job queue just for the jobs, and then workers were processing those jobs and putting results of those jobs to another queue. And then we had cron runs on Drupal that were actually just grabbing the results from the job results queue. That was one of resolution. Um, another thing is jobs can fail. Like, no matter how good they are, <laughs> experience tells that you need to anticipate that jobs will fail, and they will fail like in very multiple reasons. You can get some uh, PHP exceptions, but that will be easy to track. You can get some fun stuff with uh, server load, like it was too loaded, too crowded, job was not was not able to, pro worker was not able to process the job within the limit. And we will be talking about these limits. So in uh, usual practice, you tell the, uh, you tell the worker, okay, this is the job, but you need to process it, let's say in one minute. And if it doesn't process it, that means like something gone wrong, I will just kill you. And then this job will need to be rerun. So you, when you design your own queues, remember that you need to rerun failed jobs multiple times because before you're actually telling like there is no way to process this job. Another thing that, yes, we can fail a couple of jobs, a couple of times, but what happens if it's really something bad happened? Like we cannot really process this job. And like in the project I was working this like visual regression thing, like we were taking screenshot, screenshots of the pages. And it's totally fine if it's a website that works, but sometimes it doesn't work. Or, for example, latency is too high. I mean, I cannot just open the page. Or it's just website is broken, it's just 501, or whatever error message I get. So I rerun this job multiple times, and then I need to say to 
administrator like hey we cannot process this so deal with it and for that you can you you can do multiple things so first of all you can create another queue that's what we did we created another queue for failed jobs so we each job in uh, beside of the information about the job itself it also had the counter and when we failed the job we just increased the counter and when we reached 10 we just moved this job out of the main queue and put it to the failed jobs and in this way me as administrator i was able to monitor if i get anything new into the job and then i was able to debug these things but these jobs were not running around and like spamming my workers um, also you can do the other way you can just create a logs send emails whatever you like in our case we created failed jobs just for one reason just to be able to restart those jobs after fixing the problem. So if the problem was on our side, like, I don't know, we were doing screenshots with Selenium and Selenium sometimes just like drop off completely, right? So when we fix that issue, like Selenium is back, we can rerun those jobs again. So this is when we just move the jobs out of failed jobs queue to the main, uh, made all the counters to be no, zero and then we rerun them. In your scenarios, it might be different, but you need to really to anticipate these kind of things. Another thing that is extremely important when you're developing is monitoring. It's very fine when you don't have much jobs and they work without any problems, but the moment you will have some problems, you need to understand like, okay, I have multiple queues with jobs. I understand that something going wrong in my system. Like I need to understand which ones are failing, which are failing most often, and what can I do? Can, should I like add more workers? Or um, so there are two monitoring problems. So first one is monitoring your queues. Like the best one is if you have a graph where you can see how many jobs you had at the some period of time. So you can see like oh there was another spike or uh, like queue is empty all the time. Why do I need it? And another thing is the monitoring the workers and especially monitoring workers when you create some auto scaling systems. And this is what we did. We were able to monitor the amount of jobs in the queue. And if the amount of jobs is exceeding some limits, we were just spawning new workers. And for that, you need monitoring for workers because you can like you need to upscale your workers number and then you need to downscale if the number of jobs in the queue went down. So remember about these two monitoring options. In our technical implementation, we were running workers as the PHP processes and we were playing around with multiple uh, solutions to actually start them. One of them was PHP Daemon that is actually in production right now, but also the another tool that we started using is Supervisor. This is a daemon that is very, uh, very native for Unix systems. And the nice thing is that it's just configurable with like text file where you just specify what, what is the path to your PHP script you want to run and then like how many processes you actually like. So in your workers code, it was like, check the queue, if there is anything, do something, or you can have a loop. And then, for example, after processing 10 jobs in a row, just kill, like just exit. So you free all your memory, you don't have any memory leakages, anything like that. And then supervisor will just restart your process. So this is another very important tool. Maybe it will be useful in your cases. I must say a second recommendation for Supervisor D that it is also what I use to, uh, to ensure that my workers run smoothly. <laughs> it's very simple to use, probably the simplest uh, option you have uh, if you are running on Debian or Ubuntu. So let's be concrete. What are the solutions available? Well, there are already many, as you can see, starting with Drupal 6 for some and uh, including Drupal 8 already. We have core solutions. Uh, Drupal has come bundled with the QAPI and two queue services since Drupal 7. And the backport exists in the form of the QAPI module for Drupal 6. And the, this supplies a reliable database queue and a non-reliable memory queue. One step above, you have a contribution module which was developed for uh, an e-commerce site that some may know. 
uh, which is, uh, still uses the Drupal core database, but adds um, several more columns and provides uh, in improved monitoring facilities. This is uh, the advanced queue module. It's available only for seven, but porting it to eight should not be hard. Um, if you are looking for something more advanced and don't want to handle uh, running the operations for your servers yourself, Amazon has a cloud option, which is SQS, the simple queuing system, which is supported for seven uh, by the, uh, the Amazon SQS uh, toolkit. And my personal favorite is the Beanstalk DQ. The module has been written by Gordon Hayden, and I also uh, help maintaining it. It was written for Drupal 7, and uh, we have two branches already for Drupal 8. Neither is very really stable at this point, but uh, you can already work with, uh, with it on some versions of Drupal 8, and uh, it provides you uh, with a way to have already a, a true job server instead of relying on, on the built-ins like the database for the reasons we'll see later. And finally, uh, a French job server is EVQ, which is, which, which is starting uh, not natively for Drupal 8. This is a, a product written in C based on LibEvent, and the driver will be available in, in some weeks probably for the Drupal 8.0 release. You agree? Yeah, some of my experience. So when we were working with PHP Daemon, we had like crazy security issues with our sysadmins. And one of the arguments they put against it is actually it was depending on libevent or some other system library that was like not in stable release, even being used in for like five years or 10 years already. So another solutions that we were researching is actually Gearman. And Gearman is also pretty native. It was around for a while. And what it does, it allows you to create also like job server where you can create jobs and then have some code that will execute them. And also it has a lot of different backends. So you can write your workers code in like PHP, C, Go, like Python, anything. Um, another thing that we tried to use is actually PHP Rescue. PHP Rescue is port of the queuing system of the GitHub into the PHP. So the, uh, what, what is nice about it, it has a REST interface, so you can write to clients like no problems. And the idea is that you, when you create a job, you specify the name of the queue, and you get back the identifier of the job. And then you have another tool, another REST call to check the status of the job. And this is where you can see like, oh, it's not, uh, it's in waiting list, or it's in progress, or it's successfully completed, or it's failed. So that's another call, and also some calls like to get results, to delete the items. So it's very nice. Um, the reason we went from it uh, is just because of monitoring. And actually, that is kind of my lack of knowledge, because I'm not very familiar with Ruby. And monitoring solutions were implemented in Ruby. The ones in PHP didn't work, unfortunately, for me. So we have switched to RabbitMQ. And uh, what is nice, it's standalone daemon. You don't have much dependencies on anything else. Uh, also, it implements MPQ protocol. Uh, so it has a lot of, like, it's a little bit different. Uh, it has, like, huge set of features. I think we used maybe... I don't know, 10%, 20%. What was nice is that you get monitoring out of the box. So you can have like special URL where you have credentials and then you can see all your processes, how many workers, like everything you usually need. And it's kind of very performant thing. And there are a lot of plugins like shoveling. Shoveling is used for uh, creating your uh, like scaling your queues. So you can create one queue server in one data center, another queue server in another one. You can sync the jobs between them. So you can actually create very, very distributed network of workers. But we haven't gone that far, but just about that Rabbit and queue can do a lot of stuff. I think that's it. Yes, uh, one, I think one must also mention MongoDB. This is yet another database option, which is supported by the MongoDB package for Drupal 7. On Drupal 6, there has existed a branch at some point which included the queue, but it uh, has been withdrawn. You can still work on it if you still feel like doing work on Drupal 6. I don't. 
And uh, the work on uh, the Drupal 8 version uh, went quite far before uh, Chix, who, uh, who maintains uh, ma basically the Drupal 8 version, uh, stopped working on it uh, some months ago. But uh, the work has resumed uh, in recent weeks uh, to bring back MongoDB uh, to live on Drupal 8. And uh, it includes this queue component, uh, which has uh, some advantages of over the core queue in that it can scale much better, of course, to uh, very high workloads without impacting the core uh, database itself. And finally, uh, there's, of course, Redis, which is a, a very common option for handling queues. And uh, there's a queue for Redis, not in the Redis package on Drupal.org, but in a separate Redis queue package. This is for 6 and 7 only. Now that we've seen why we want to do, do queuing and uh, what products exist, what does Drupal provide us with? Basically, Drupal, as I said, provided, provides us with the queue API, which defines a number of concepts. The first of these is the queue itself. What is the queue? Well, in, for Drupal at least, this is just a, soft, a sort of low-featured tube, a FIFO, first in, first out, without any uh, further mechanisms. It's just a tube with a name in which you put data at one end and get it at the other end. Another term you can encounter is the worker. The worker is the callback which your runner will trigger to perform actually the work on, uh, based on the data which has received from the queue. This data is called an item. So some, someone at some point places items in the queue some runner extracts them from the queue, passes them to the worker for them to work on, and when the work is done, the runner receives the result and passes the information to Drupal so, so that the queuing can proceed. Another term, as you mentioned, is the batch subsystem, which is using the queue system already, but it adds another layer of API on top of the queue API itself, and it's also an older API and uh, which is maybe uh, more Drupal specific. It enables you to define a starting point for, uh, for a job, an ending point, and uh, in the middle, several sub-jobs, which can themselves be subdivided by time quota and pass information in a sandbox from one iteration to the next. This is uh, what Drupal has been using since Drupal 5, I guess, for at least for updates, for translation, imports, and a few other queues. But it doesn't use them, for instance, for the aggregator. In Drupal 8, you have also two related concepts, which are the queue worker manager and the queue worker plugins. So in the, this API has not changed much in uh, between 6, 7, and 8. In Drupal 6 and 7, uh, it's available either in queue or in contrib, and you declare queues the same way with an info hook. This hook is hook run queue info, and like many info hooks in Drupal, it has an alter hook to allow uh, third-party modules to modify existing definitions. The API can be used without cron, but it defaults to being run on every cron, cron run. When you declare a uh, queue, you can declare that it needs to be skipped on cron, and if it's not skipped and cron is uh, handling the queue, then you can declare a maximum time during which cron can spend time working on any given number of items from any number of queues. And the main uh, parameter in this info is for any queue, the callback uh, queue worker, which is uh, the, the callback which will be called to process all items on the given queue. The jobs are run by the cron subsystem, which is um, down in the includes of uh, Drupal core. And uh, as Yuri mentioned, uh, workers can uh, cause errors and throw exceptions. And uh, uh, re regrettably, core just does what is called Pokemon handling. It, it's got to catch them all. It tries the, your worker and catch, whatever. It's uh, just a catch exception E. So it does nothing with your exceptions. It's not smart about it. In Drupal 8, things are a bit better. M many things, as you can see, have not changed. Cron is still providing support to run the jobs in your queue, except it's now based on the Drupal core Cron class instead of being down in the includes. And there's specific handling for one type of exception, which is uh, the sus suspend queue exception, in which case the runner knows that your worker has handled uh, an erroneous situation itself 
and the job must be rerun. In that case, it catches that exception, uh, re releases the job which has been claimed by the worker, and passes it for a later run. Since we no longer use info hooks in Drupal 8, the hook run queue info uh, hook has been replaced by a plugin manager, which uh, creates uh, instantiates queue worker plugins. Their settings, as you can see, are very similar, enable cron or not, the change being that it now defaults to off instead of defaulting to on in Drupal 6 and 7, and time, again, which is the maximum lifetime allocated to run uh, any number of jobs for any number of queues if using the cron runner. Core uses this in two places currently. One, to refresh the feeds, which is one of the cases uh, we discussed earlier, and to update the local translations. Finally, the info hook has a small remain, the, uh, remaining part, which is the alter hook, which is used to alter the, the plugin definitions. The, so if we look at the first part of the API, what's in the queue API itself? Now, the first point is putting data into the queue. For this, you have the create item method on a queue object. Once you have a queue object, you create item and pass as you can see, mixed data. So the, there's no type hinting. You can put just about anything. It's a blob to the, to the QAPI. It doesn't do anything with it. And it doesn't return anything. You don't even know if the, uh, the submit was successful. Then at the other end, the runner will claim items from the queue. That is, it will mark them as being, wor being worked by the worker. And it will uh, claim some time to work on them. By default, one hour, as you can see and it will pass the data it receives from the queue to a worker, again, as a blob object, except that's, a, that's an STD class in which it, you know there will be uh, some properties, like the item ID, the data uh, itself, and the time uh, it was created. This list time parameter, which you, uh, the runner must pass to the queue, is a maximum duration after which the, the queue is allowed to kill the job for, for the runner. However, Core does nothing with it currently. When your run worker has completed its work, it can delete the item from the queue, marking it to be completely done, and the work can proceed. If, however, it failed to perform the job, it can then release an item, maybe it, there was a resource uh, conflict and it could not uh, perform the work, so the work can be put back into the queue. That's what the release operation provides. There's a very minimal uh, operation uh, regarding monitoring, which is the estimate the number of items in the queue. This is uh, specifically documented as a best guess, uh, unreliable. Providers are allowed to return zero at any time. And anyway, even if they are re reliable when returning the information, you can still get a race conditions when multiple workers are involved. So it, it's at best just an indicator for statistics and not something you want to rely on in processing. And finally, uh, you create queues and delete queues. Creating queue is a very lightweight operation. With most providers, it act doesn't actually do anything because the queue are really instantiated when you, when you create items in them. Delete queue, on the other hand, is not completely symmetrical because it deletes the queue registration within Drupal, but it also deletes all items that it contained. So one is uh, idempotent, but the other is, is idempotent but loses data. Finally, all of this is our properties of the queue interface in Drupal 8. And we also have an extended interface, which is the reliable queue interface which has no methods, no constants, but specify that if you request an interface of the reliable type, you will get a queue which is expected to provide ordering of the items as a FIFO, which is not guaranteed by the default queue, and single execution, meaning exactly once. Finally, in 8, you have some other helper methods available. You have the queue service, which is the only part related to the dependency injection container, which gets you a class 
plugin uh, from, from instead of having to build it yourself. You get this factory, you pass a name, and you specify if you want the queue to be reliable. There is a complex interaction be between various settings on your site and the code installed, which will actually give you either a reliable or not reliable uh, queue, whatever you pass in this parameter. So it takes so take some time to read uh, the code to see how it works because it's quite surprising if you don't uh, take time to understand the settings. The queue manager, as I said, instantiates the queue worker plugins and uh, uh, it uses the definitions from the plugin system and adds the alter hook uh, as in previous versions. And finally, there's also an interface for the queue workers, which specifies that workers must implement just one method, which is the, the, the process item method, which is expected to receive the data, again, as a blob, and which may throw the, this uh, specific suspend queue exception. The last bit uh, in, uh, in this panorama are the runners. Core provides uh, the, cron, uh, the cron runner, which we already mentioned. But you also have a very popular Elysia cron module in uh, 6, 7, and 8, uh, at least 7 and 8, I'm not sure, which tries to replicate the, the features of cron while adding its own internal scheduler. There's also a brand new module for Drupal 8, which is the queue runner, which adds the ability to chain jobs, much like uh, the, the batch system. And you have uh, built-in com uh, commands in Drush, without any additional plugins to support listing the queue plugins in 8 or uh, executing a cron run from Drush. All these runners share similar limitations. Uh, they work uh, the, much the same way. They call the same code. They have no support for preempting operations that take, to, that take too long. So the time parameter is not used. The least time parameter is not used. They are all single-threaded. PHP is single-threaded, of course. And you have a single process to, uh, that works ac across all queues, looping first outside loop on the queues, and within that, uh, the, that loop, another loop looping on the item of, uh, on any given queue that is being processed, which means that any uh, queue can possibly starve the other queues just by putting too, too, many, too many items. This is not a fair share a scheduler, and you probably want in many uh, circumstances to write your own uh, runner, which will be, allow you to specify which queues you want to handle in any given number of processes and maybe kill items that take too long or things like that. There's room in Contrib for that, where I didn't find any, and I don't think you find one either, Yuri. But basically, most projects doing serious works with queues will want their own runner. This queue API is uh, very good in that it provides us with a common ways of talking with the, all the, pro the providers, the job servers we saw. But it has limitations. As I said, it's a limited FIFO paradigm. First, if you don't ask for a reliable queue, you get a queue which does not guarantee, actually guarantee you to be a FIFO, which does not guarantee you single execution, and which doesn't guarantee you execution at all. Actually, jobs can just be lost, or can come in any order, or be, be executed any number of times. It's essentially a datagram service. So always ask for a reliable queue, which most providers actually supply. Also, it does not have any extra queuing discipline. That means, for instance, you don't have priority management. You can say, I put this in a queue, but it's higher priority, so it should come before the others, go before them in the queue. You can tag items to fetch, to allow a runner to specify, I want some specific items from a queue. You can't replace an item in the queue. You have to delete it and push it again. You don't have the option to submit an item for delayed execution. This is provided by Beanstalk, for instance, or to bury an item, meaning if there's been a problem, for instance, I can still leave it in the queue, but it won't be eligible to be claimed by any worker until I raise it again. This, none of this is supplied. Again, as Yuri mentioned, there's no built-in monitoring. There's no peak operation. There's no way to, be the, to do a last-in, first-out system. But for all this, if you actually think, you have some hacks using, which are possible using uh, the, the built-in methods. You can delete items, recreate them, uh, various ways to implement most of these things. And also, since queues are very lightweight objects, 
you can very well, in many situations, create as many queues as you want, uh, possibly in the thousands range. It doesn't cost really a lot because most, most queues don't actually have any implementations. They are just items in, a, in another big, larger queue. And finally, whenever you implement such a system, like we are doing for EVQ, uh, you may provide a richer interface on top of the queue interfaces. So finally, how can we go further on performance? Yuri, you have suggestions, I guess? Yeah, so some of things about runners. Um, the idea is that when we, so you shouldn't do such thing like active polling. So when we have one process just pulling, like checking all the time if there are anything like that. I, I mean, if there are anything in the job queue. So instead there are, um, there are solutions where they, you hold the process on the socket and then when the job comes in, it will be triggered and then you will get the job. Um, the next one is the, uh, so the, the problem with this is that uh, we are going to have like multiple selects uh, hitting our, if, for example, the database, if we have the uh, queue in the database. Um, another thing is that very important for performance when you, uh, when you create the queuing system is to think about running all your jobs in parallel. So this is when you would like to create multiple job runners. And also what is very important is to have different runners per different queue. So you will not get this Drupal, Drupal story of having multiple queues and they are being run one by one. And if there is, an, there is one problem with one queue, other queues will just not run at all. So when you create runners, just create multiple processes, like, I don't know, three, four runners per queue. In this way, you will have some kind of guarantee that all of them will be processed in parallel. At least if you will have some problem, you will identify that problem pretty fast. Um, the item regarding read after write. This is about the caching. So when you are refreshing, the, uh, when you are invalidating the cache, and this is what happens, for example, in Drupal, when we update the content, we invalidate multiple caches in the system. So after you do that, one nice thing is actually to trigger rebuild of the new caches as well. So after invalidating, just hit the read. It can be very basic, like if we updated the node, just trigger get request to that node URL. In this way, you will refresh the caches, and there is way lower chance to get this happy user who will wait for one minute on your website to get the caches warmed up. And that's all we had to say about the topic. Uh, we, and I will welcome your questions. We have, I guess, about nine minutes to, if you have any questions. And you are invited, of course, to come to the sprint uh, on Friday and to uh, tell us what you thought about the, this presentation on the presentation node uh, on the schedule. So if you have any questions, there's a microphone over there. Oh, you can just ask questions. We will repeat them for recording. Yes, please. Okay, so uh, what he just explained, if I just uh, well understood, is that you wrote as a, a, a binding of the queue API to services in order to expose a standard way to access queues remotely. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very nice. And uh, I didn't, didn't see it when we looked uh, for what was available. Is it published on Drupal.org? They have gotten Are they running Rush? So sure that way, or are they talking directly with the 
Okay, so the question is how do, do the workers uh, communicate with Drupal? I think we have two strategies. Uh, you re explained uh, the, his case with the command system where he had uh, to rebuild a quite specific uh, way of writing the, the database by bundling uh, mm -hmm. inserts together uh, uh, on a database which was otherwise uh, read only. It's quite specific. Can you say more about it, maybe? Yes, so uh, this is the problem of where to store results and things. So one of the solutions is that, yes, workers can have access to the database, and then, then when they get job done, they push results to the database directly. That's one of the cases. Or in case of the comments, it's actually their job to put data to the database, right? There was another application that were like screenshots things. So in that case, we didn't want to make workers to communicate with database for security reasons because they were on completely different servers. And we wanted to scale up our servers like uh, immediately. And we didn't know the IP addresses of those servers. So we didn't want to give the whole world to be able to access our MySQL. So in that case, we stored all the results to the queue. I mean, the different queue, but to the same queuing system. And then we had a little process on Drupal side next to MySQL that was actually getting those results and putting them to the MySQL. So these are strategies that we used. So when you weren't using Drupal queue, you were paying directly to the outside services, whether it be Redis, your local system, or install Amazon, or Amazon. Yes, so we were using the external services. We didn't use the Drupal queues. In one case, that was Redis. In the other, that was Revit. Okay, I should say, I, uh, this, is, this sounds to me quite uh, unusual. In most cases, I think you want to want to write the worker as a drush command because this is quite a uh, quite simple way to ensure that you will have a properly booted Drupal and that you'll be able to access the whole Drupal API. And since you are running a drush command, you are running on the CLI SAPI, meaning you have essentially unlimited time and unlimited memory if you configure your PHP properly. I think that's the majority case. Yes? Uh, I just want to say that there is a model called the Confident Cube that defines a direct trust command that spans uh, processes to process the, the queues uh, and, uh, and the number of workers that work. Okay, so the, this, this is about a module called Concurrent Queue, which apparently allows uh, to submit the work to the multiple queues concurrently so that can be processed in parallel, thus alleviating the problem we have with the, the, the big loops in the standard processing. Thanks. Yes, could you speak in the microphone? Because we are, otherwise we have to repeat the questions. It's, it's not very convenient for people who are not present in this room and who are, who are listening on to the video or who will be hopefully listening to the video in days and months and years to come. <laughs> well, how do you guys uh, deal with failed items in general? Do you have a standard best practice or it depends in the kind in the nature of the queue? Do you use some country module or something standard? Uh, I can talk to that. So the, I mean, especially for retries. Yeah, so the implementation that we had, that was very custom. So we didn't use any, that was not related to anything to contrib modules of Drupal. So in that case, we just rerun, we increased the counters, and then we just had failed jobs. And my job was like, every morning I started my job like, oh, do we have any failed jobs overnight? And yes, we have. Now we have another couple of hours of debugging. So that was kind of best practicing for me. But it's like you get the situations a lot in the beginning, but then you start understanding, oh, okay, I eliminated all the use cases that can come from this subsystem. And then all possible cases from another subsystem. And then by the end, probably you end up with not having these cases. But in the beginning, that like 100% you will have something. But no Drupal modules, unfortunately. One last, last question, maybe. We only have two minutes. Well, just a, a module that I started to use recently. It's, a, it's just the opposite of running in parallel. I, I was using Drash Q run with a supervisor a setup. And, and I found out uh, a module called mop execute uh, that does the, does the opposite. It runs uh, several seconds and, and iterates among all the system queues, and it, it runs the, all the queues uh, in a fair share. 
So you are mm -hmm. always looping through all the queues, and you just have to deploy a single process running in loop, uh, and you can deploy these, these very same in as machines as you want. Okay, this is interesting. I didn't quite get the name of the modular. It's mop-exe-q. I Mod started using Q. recently, okay. and it works very well for me. Thank you very much for this information. Okay, so I think we'll close uh, this. Thank you for attending and for your questions, which are quite insightful. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Exactly.